The Other Five presents Miss Arlene Francis and Mr. Martin Gable in Flights of Angels. Hollis Hennicott. You'd know it was him, wouldn't you? Anybody'd know him. Even though he's smashed about blind and he's got the dust of the grave on him. Oh, I'd know him? Of course I'd know him. Yeah, I would. Ah, I knew you would. There's only one face more famous than that one. That's the Indian head nickel. And his voice. <laughs> You'll hear it any minute now. It's as if there was a tape recorder inside him. It'll give you the chills just to hear him. Does he really put away as much booze as the papers say? Does he? Listen, I'm the fool that serves him, and I should be arrested. Oh, I'd know him anywhere, no matter how much he's been drinking. Ah, good evening, miss. Sit here. Uh, we're talking about Hollis Hennicott, the famous actor, you know? Up there, the other end of the bar. Would you guess it? He's been sitting there over three hours, not moving. Did you ever think that he may be ill? Ah, he's halfway through his second fifth of pinch bottle. He's not sick. He's dead. No living man could drink so much. But the style of the man, even as he sits there... Well, you've got to hand it to him. He knows you're talking about him. Barkeep. Service. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Hennicott. Now, here's a host of mild, unmannered morons lined expectantly before a brass rail bar like bursting bosses in their stalls. Such yucks. You'd turn a decent bar for drinks into a bleak, tiled washroom or a railroad stop. Let's pull the penance down, throw up tiled walls and nickel-slotted cubicles so these good country folk will feel at home. My God, how low the days have fallen now. In times gone by, unlock a door and in would walk a Barrymore, MacArthur, all the old Chicago gang, with drinking as their form of speech. And speech a thirsting rage. You do appreciate my downfall, huh? Oh, sure I do, Mr. Hennicott. Will anyone among you duffers join me in a drink? Perhaps in closer touch, a chance for emulation. This old art of guzzling may inspire apprenticeship. Well, I'll join you, sir. If you'll accept an amateur without regard for sex or station, or the fact that I'm starting from a dead stop. Miguel, it is my pleasure. But let me say this beforehand, that your craftsmanship in drinking booze cannot exceed your charm. Please, name your potion. Whatever you're drinking is good enough for me. I'll have the same, thank you. If you have no objections, I'll offer up a toast. A toast, a most refining act. No drink, my pet, should down without a toast. It is the proud salute to liquor and the culture which makes liquor necessary. I lift a drink to youth and kindness. Yours, seen patronizing age and wisdom. Mine. And now, while the sap begins to flow, I'll drink to whichever one of us will be able to propose the final toast. And I pray it'll be you, Mr. Hennicott. That smacks of impropriety. I can't... We drink. 
You're a great man, Hennecott. Mm, I'm great at drinking, we'll concede. No more. Isn't that the key to the whole thing? You know what you remind me of? Mm. You remind me of a great old tree that's been uprooted. And this drinking bit, it's nothing but the rot that's set in. Young woman, did you come to drink or are you emissary for the worms? Wait impatiently to gnaw within my beer. Aha! That's what I am. A worm. A little faceless beast. Yes, I am a worm, great master. But I'll never make it feeding on your cadaver. Just a poor little worm. Do you know this bartender? Did we meet here to drink or just to talk? Uh... You too, Mr. Hennicott? Of course. Now, may I call you Mademoiselle? You could call me many things. It could be many things, and quite often it is, but just call me girl. My girl, I drink to worms united everywhere. My dear... I beg forgiveness for my crimes of arrogance and self-indulgence, knowing well that I have putrefied my flesh ahead of time to leave no more than rancid meat for all the things that crawl, much pickled as I am in disenchantment's brine. We worms want more than that. There's nothing else for worms to feed upon. My mind has flown before me, fled an eagle from the nest. All that stays behind are imprints of its clutch where giant talons used to hold their grip. Oh, come off it, you mildewed hat. The drunker you get, the more maudlin and self-pitying you are. It's time for a toast. Maestro, I drink to your pilot light. The feeble, little old, glimmering glow of your great spirit. The lamp that only worms can read by. Shall we drink? You know, you're a lovely worm. Green eyes, did I once love you? I just ask. The damned ferocity of your campaign is kindling anguish in your eyes. I'm twice your age and miserably senile, and I'm also fairly pauperized. This is the last of my day's ration, but it will serve up, I think, another toast to you. The ardor of your bright combativeness with pity for the emptiness of view and the lack of enemies worthwhile. Thank you, kind sir. It just happens that this new age of emancipation allows me to open my purse and wave a magic green wand. Bartender, please. May we have another bottle? Mr. Hennicott... I risk appearing prissy, but I must protest. My dear, haven't you had enough? Why, you old goat, you bag of wind. You brag to all of us the tankards you hadn't yet drunk. You call us cows, and now you want to call off the contest. Oh, I say, Leon Macduff. And damned be he that first cries, hold enough. Don't be an old worm. No, I could have loved you in another day. You've heard, I guess, about my dozen wives with, I suppose, distorted notions of their prowess. But are you aware that I have somewhere a daughter who's a girl like you? An actress, I believe. I haven't seen her since she was a child. I say, are you... Am I an actress? Call me that. 
And now I invite you to behold my greatest scene when I make like a girl about to take a drink. I make a toast to all good actors, especially men. We won't. We'll stop, my little worm, right here. Before your loveliness has crumbled down and made a mess of forlorn clay, I can't be party to the scene of your decay. Oh, is this the bully boy who shouted dare to all of us in this very bar? You're a fraud, a stinking counterfeit. You've had enough. I've had enough of bullies, that's what I've had. Forget it, I'll drink alone. And it happened. You will not drink at all. The game is done. No, no. You cannot challenge me, or I cast off your challenge. Who am I? The Hecuba. The Hecuba is me. Bartender? Bartender, will you help me get him up? He's an old man. He deserves the best of care. I know, lady. I know. daughter. She's an actress, too, or so the rumor says. You're not a family man, old Hennicott, so stop pretending. The next thing we know, you'll be pinching me and telling me your twelfth wife doesn't understand you. My family is the blood of man. But now that you've hooked me with this clabbered brew, coffee, confess your own identity. Who are you? Me? I am blood, a brew you'll not ignore, for I am blood that's dark and coursing wild, that's secretive and necessary, churned in hidden vats. I carry tidings from the ages, and I care not what the tide. That may be so. I've often thought that blood can be a liquid worm. A crawling thing that does right well to hide itself within the aching channels of its circuit. You are a worn-out heart. Pumped dry and lame. And I am blood rampant. I spill myself beyond denial through the worm ways of your conscience. Conscience? Conscience is a stale, tired word which signifies... The feeble ache of passion because it's been betrayed. Whoever you may be, you're intriguing. But I warn you... Don't fret for my undoing at your hands. I have a date who meets me here, a rogue. There's time till then for me to lecture you on love and tragedy. Your errors, sir. You speak of love and tragedy to me? Love has been the footfall of a wraith I could not overtake. And marriage was the act of inconvenience. Just the wake that mourned for my continuing defeat. But tragedy... The tragedy I feel is frightening. So far beyond your ken that words would cripple its cognition. That does it. Hennicott, you are no more than any pompous phony. All this talk of tragic trash. It's trash. You drive a decent girl to drink. Barky! You're surfeited with aches from your routine, as are your many fellow worms, all hot with irritation over petty plagues. I envy you. I do. I bow to your myopia which cannot even guess at the oppression of a black sun's beat. You can't suspect the terror of its rays, the beat of which brings shudder to the race. 
I call it rubbish. No, it's not for you, not yours at all. So strike my... my maunderings from off the record. I'll recant, because you know why? Because truth is doom. And knowing truth is dread. It's quite apparent that you sense the truth of this stark, tragic sense and writhe with it from jealousy at feeling none of it. No, I deny at all this fear of yours. This makes you squander genius and befoul the name you've brought to honor. This is it because you fear? I fear it not. This is vocabulary from the worm world. Fear, I do not fear. I know. That is the cause of my damnation. Witnessing for doom. I am organ for the tragic sense, not judge or critic for it, not detached. Be gone, I drink to your confusion. Girl, my confusions will not be undone, at least not in a single evening, from the badgerings of one much drunken wench. Oh, now I am a wench. Is this above the status of a lowly worm or not? Well, you have the lifelines of a wench. You show genetic fealty to the heritage of barmaids, gypsy necromancers, and the mistresses of kings. But is there nothing else you see? No trace of bastard aristocracy? No glimpse of haughty, tragic genius? Sired, perhaps, by kings in bawdy lapses with barmaids? No. Nothing else. I see no trace of it. Our worm should not pretend too much. Old man, your distress is this. You're growing old. You're out of work. This is the burden you've brought to me. This is all. There is no more. You've had it, master. This is it. And with it can come careful living. Husbanding of your gigantic talents. Nursing for your sickness. Chance to die with grace and not in gutted helplessness. That's all I bring. You really should go home. You have your own variety of sickness and sore need of nursing. No. There is no home for blood. It pays its periodic visits to the heart and leaps in happy tumult there, but must not stay. Must go. Must run. Farewell. Please stay. I'll see you home. Oh, no. We worms cannot consort with soaring eagles. We just grub along our muddy, sightless paths. That I might find an apple such as this within the orchard of eternity. Alive with such a morsel in its core. Bartender. Yes, sir, Mr. Hennigan. That girl was Joan. My daughter, was it not? Yes, sir. I'm pretty sure it was. Of course. I felt the whisper of her blood in mine. Pour out this mediocre broth and bring the bottle, barkeep. For the eagle flies. We wheel and climb away from blood's hot call to scorch in shadows of the black, bleak sun. We soar with unbelieving fatalism to perish strangers in the screaming night. I know, Mr. Hennicott. I know. The other 
Theater 5 has presented Flights of Angels, starring Miss Arlene Francis and Mr. Martin Gable. Written by Burr McCloskey, directed by Ted Bell. Featured in the cast, Ralph Bell, Ruth York, and Arthur Cole. Script editor, Jack C. Wilson. Original music by Alexander Vlastotsenko. Orchestra under the direction of Glenn Osser. Executive producer for Theater 5, Mr. Lee Bowman. We invite your comments. Write to Theater 5, New York 23, New York. This is Fred Foy speaking. has been an ABC Radio Network production.